thank you for that. And Jane, thank you for your words. I'm going to use first names, if I may. And I shall tell you in a moment of a rather special reason to be thanking you. This is an inspirational moment for how, and if I may say, for the Centre for Ethnographic Theory at SOAS. Giovanni has just reminded us of Howe's stirring rubric and its recall of the days when anthropology gave concepts to the world, such as taboo and mana, not so, not so far off from the days when Most was writing. Interestingly, however, what Most did was take a concept, gift-giving, as thoroughly evident from his own world as it was to be found everywhere else. There was an inquiry to be made into the conditions of contract and exchange wherever the law of things connects to the law of persons. Indeed, without treating the whole range of his material seriously, unfamiliar or familiar, he could not, could not have mounted a political commentary of any purchase. One consequence, of course, is that the concept of gift-giving seems everywhere. It certainly doesn't belong to sociology and certainly not to anthropology. Across the arts and humanities, of course, and outside academia altogether, it flourishes with its own momentum. So anthropologists should not be too dazzled by the way it travels in our midst, cropping up in issues to do with charity, with corruption, with inheritance taxes, with the ethics of so open source software and so forth. What is dazzling is something else, the way Marcel Mauss travels, the way it's his name that is so, is so often on, so often attached to discussions of gift giving. Thus a professor of medical ethics writing on property in the body who could perfectly well have kept with the passionate argument for blood donation that Titmus made in his book, The Gift Relationship, feels compelled to cite Mauss as the classical text. And there it is. Amidst all the references to DNA samples, the UK Biobank, and World Health Organizational guidelines, in the words of its second translation, the form and reason for exchange in archaic societies. And it's with most in mind, this medical ethicist suggests, that a French jurist has been marshalling arguments against the French's, French state's absolute insistence on the irrevocable alienability of the gift in organ transplantation. <laughs> if he'd had the benefit of Jane's title, we would also have encountered the gift, the form and sense of exchange in archaic societies as the very title of an installation by the New Zealand artist Michael Stevenson. Wanting to engage art collectors, in this case in Germany, with the concept of reciprocity, he staged his installation with this title through numerous transactions that meant they were caught up in various giving and receiving relationships with him. The focus through which he channeled their attention was a replica of a wartime raft from which an impoverished artist had years ago been saved. His press release quotes most on Malinowski, a passage about the recipient's commitment to make a return gift, and a review of one of Stevenson's traveling um, exhibitions at the Herbert Reed Gallery says that among the exhibits was a vitrine stocked with relics and inside was a copy of Moses anthropological study and the review spells it out, the gift, the form and reason for exchange in archaic societies. Now I'll come back in a moment as to why I'm particularly happy that the word archaic is there. Because at first sight it seems a bit awkward. Now nearer home in the humanities one might have some expectation of encountering Moses' travelling name. One could include an academic lawyer here, referring to the gift, the gift culture of research scholarship, who does not just cite Moos, but draws on the connection Moos himself made between literary works and the author's enduring interest in them. Moos was talking about the then recent shifts in French intellectual property law 
and the belated recognition of the person in the thing. Not so surprising then that a professor of Victorian literature writing on me mementos and collectibles as ambiguously at once fungible objects and ineffable relics should turn to anthropology and who should be leading in the small caste, but most. That said, the Victorianist specifically argues against the idea that this ambiguity was a residue of an archaic gift impulse rather than being understood as part of capitalism's success. Indeed, anthropologist friend in history and comparative literature, Natalie Zeman Davis, made a similar comment apropos the political significance of gifts in 16th century France. Most is there, of course, on her very first page, again leading in a number of anthropologists, although they are, in her view, by no means the only scholars to have implied that gift exchange inevitably gives way before the market. Recent work, she says, has since made the gift landscape much more open. However, the anthropologist has to get really close to home, to contemporary sociology, to find the objection to archaism being made vehemently, I would even say nastily. David Cheel, in his version of the gift economy, is withering in his dismissal of most anthropological work and heading the queue once more, of course, is most. Cheel's problem is that he wants to reinstate the gift, he, Cheel, that is, to reinstate the gift as indicative of a moral economy symbolizing the central values of a love culture based on the free and choiceful disposition of objects. And Moses' sin was to maintain, I quote, that the study of the gift involved a return to the old and elemental. Most happily, our new translation suggests that Moses wrote something closer to we can and should come back to the archaic, to its elements. Not quite the same. But all the same, archaic. Well, I'm glad that most referred to archaic societies and that Jane has kept the title that way. Of course, from today's hindsight, we can read archaic ironically in a way I'm sure most himself never meant. Nevertheless, what the, effort, what the epithet wonderfully does is bring a huge elephant into the room. In fact, it creates an elephant in the room. If there is the faintest hint that there might be something of interest to present circumstances in the form and sense of exchange in archaic societies, then archaic can only be read ironically. I mean, they have never been archaic. This is said another way in the English term itself. Now, I've no idea if any of you would agree, but to me, the epithet sounds a bit different from primitive or antiquated or outmoded. Itself slightly archaic, it makes one sit up. Archaic carries the resonance of something that is characteristic of an earlier period, so no longer current, but nonetheless a style that once had its own integrity. I'm not defending the temporality implied, but rather the hint all over again that there might be elements from possibilities beyond our horizons to which it would be good to attend. And this, of course, was the moment, of, of, uh, it was the conclusion of what Jane has just been talking about. The point is an old one precisely because it recurs. I mean, the old goes on coming back because it needs to be there with us each new day. So why, dazzling as they are, those examples I gave of Moses' name being brought in all over the place? Sometimes his name travels alone. Sometimes it brings in its trail other anthropologists. Perhaps it's too optimistic to imagine that the invocation of Moses' name beyond anthropology carries a gesture, <coughs> however uninformed, towards anthropological sources of knowledge in peoples everywhere as though there were larger truths, even if one does not go there oneself. 
that anthropology might hold. An awkward hope for anthropologists to respond adequately, of course. But this is one of the places where the new translation will have its impact. I was deeply moved by the contextualization of the essay on the gift. And there is more, of course, as the projet Moose people have been telling us for years. Precisely as a memorial should do, this contextualization makes one think of a larger world beyond the immediate horizon, not something one can do alone. I've indicated a few places where beyond anthropology, people have found in anthropology something of a larger world to which they would no doubt aspire to be part of or else dramatically get rid of. We can glimpse our discipline as momentarily on the horizons of others. The actual examples are rather small in the bigger order of things, but they make the structural point. We might find illumination not only by forever worrying at the perspective anthropology has on the world, but also appreciating how, for well or ill, others have perspectives on anthropology, a gesture towards a wider world contained in the gesture towards most. And that exchange of perspectives is something we might listen to more closely if we attend to its dynamic as an explicitly enacted element of some forms of gift exchange. For all that in its work of detachment, the gift has the contours of the commodity, whether in the French jurist's vision of effective alienation or as a precursor to the utility of trade, the gift that compels a return compels an exchange of perspectives that is not quite captured in the usual vernacular notions about the endless points of view that we all have on one another. The new translation is not just another point of view. It surely arises from a literary counterpart to the exchange of perspectives, although the translator has to act roles, as it were, as both donor and recipient at once. For it's only by seeing the text as it is, taking from both the form and sense of it, that the translator can produce its counterpart and give back to the original a version of itself from another world. Jane, you've animated this extraordinary work. You've made us think again of the form and sense in which anthropological knowledge circulates. Now, I know you wouldn't want me to wish that your name travels alongside Moses, and he will continue to do his work for us all, but I secretly hope that it will. The gift that makes us think never outruns its gifts. Thank you. <laughs>